The Atlanta Falcons had one of the most confusing drafts we have seen in recent years, selecting Michael Penix Jr. with the 8th overall pick after signing Kirk Cousins to a multiple year deal. And for many days after this draft, so many people were trying to wrap their heads around this move. But to me, it made perfect sense. And in fact, the Falcons were also trying to trade back up into the first round to select another player just a little while after. According to reports, they tried to trade for the 10th pick from the New York Jets and then the 27th pick that the Arizona Cardinals owned. Following the draft's second night, during which the Falcons selected defensive tackle Rook Aroraro, who is the most fun name to say ever, and edge rusher Braylon Trice. Fontenot revisited Atlanta's first round trade up efforts and revealed there were multiple pass rushers he had in mind. He also added that Atlanta had interest in other players outside of the defensive line group, but addressing the pass rush certainly was a priority. Nonetheless, he said he and head coach Raheem Morris were still excited about how the situation unfolded. These are some of the highlights from one of his press conferences talking about the whole thing. Today's uh, surplus is tomorrow's necessity, and so you can never feel like it, it's you have enough in any area, you always want to take really good players and continue to build your experience and yeah you've been without that you've been without a quarterback you know how critical that is and then you were able to be here in atlanta with the beginning with matt and i heard you say at one point how you knew right away as soon as matt got in the building you could see certain things the way he talked the way he carried himself that okay we got one here so basically fatino was saying that even with kirk cousins you can never have enough of something and you can never feel like you're secure at a certain position okay. i think the argument can be made both ways because for a lot of people it's like why would you go out and sign a qb of kirk cousins caliber to that deal and not spend draft picks putting weapons around him but on the other hand if you look towards the future or if kirk somehow got injured because he is coming off a serious injury you have a guy behind him that is ready to go it can also sit on the sideline and be mentored by Kirk. And then similar to the Packers situation when they drafted Jordan Love with Aaron Rodgers still on the team, we saw how that ended up working out with Love learning the game behind him and then when it was time to step up, he was ready for the moment and now the Packers have a super bright future. And one thing that I feel like so many people are completely forgetting about is how good Michael Penix Jr. actually is. He led Washington to the national championship and he was taking a beating but still gave his all in that game. Five wide receivers. Spread the field, short pass to West over the tight end, caught it to the 15. Nice move. Looking to his right, throws deep down the field. Adunze's open again, catches it at the Michigan 40. In his 2023 season at Washington, Penix threw for 4,903 yards with a 36 to 11 touchdown to interception ratio. This was the best season of his collegiate career by far. And honestly, if you look from his first season to his last in college, he improved almost every single year outside of the ones that he was injured in. It's completely understandable why quarterback was the highest priority for the organization this offseason. After all, no position has a greater impact in all of sports. However, the Falcons' pursuit of Kirk Cousins and subsequent decision to draft Michael Penix Jr. has left the Falcons without a proven top-tier pass rusher. That's not an issue that necessarily dooms the Falcons this fall. I'd much rather have a question mark at pass rush than quarterback, but it does mean Atlanta will once again need players to step up. The team's 42 sacks in 2023 were the most produced by a Falcons defense since the 2004 season, which should be viewed as a positive. However, three key pieces from last year are gone. Ryan Nielsen, Calias Campbell, and Bud Dupree, two of which combined for 13 sacks. Alright, so during minicamps, the Falcons participated in 11 on 11 walkthroughs before moving into special teams work and practicing onside kicks. It was a slow and abbreviated day, one that leads into a family day Wednesday before players officially break for 6 weeks prior to the start of training camp. For what seems like the first time in full team installs during open viewing portions for the media, third round rookie edge rusher Braylon Trice worked with the Falcons second team defense. He spent much of the spring working with the third and fourth teams. Atlanta's defensive ends consisted of James Smith Williams. Williams and Zach Harrison, while its edge featured Trice, Lorenzo Carter, and Arnold Ebikady. At defensive tackle, Taquan Graham, Eddie Goldman, Ruga Rororo, and Contavia Street rotated with the first and second teams, while Grady Jarrett and David Anyamata didn't participate. 
Caden Ellis and Nate Landman head the first turns at linebacker, with Landman later pairing Troy Anderson in the middle of Atlanta's defense before Ellis returned in place of Landman. The Falcons appear likely to feature Ellis while Landman and Anderson rotate depending on packages. In the secondary, Mike Hughes served as the Falcons' number two cornerback behind AJ Terrell, while Richie Grant was the starting safety next to Jesse Bates. D. Alford was the nickel during five defensive back packages. When Atlanta turned to the second team, Clark Phillips III and Anthony Johnson took over at cornerback while Antonio Hamilton worked at nickel. DeMarco Hellums and Micah Abernathy were the safeties. Later, Hellums worked alongside Bates. Those two have been primary first teamers throughout OTAs and the same held true in minicamp. Falcons secondary coach Justin Hood told reporters last Wednesday the rotations are simply to see different combinations with the hopes of finding the right one when communication and performance marry one another. Anyways, moving on, enough of all the camp stuff because the Falcons are now on their six week summer break. So now I wanna talk about the depth chart and the weapons around center heading into 2024. So in the backfield, Bijan Robinson will be returning as the starting running back after putting up 976 yards and four touchdowns in the 2024 season. And behind him will be Tyler Algier, who had 683 yards and also four touchdowns. And Atlanta's offensive line made significant strides over the past three years under Ledford's guide. And the New York Giants requested to speak with him for their offensive line vacancy this spring. As for the receiving core, this is an unproven group with a ton of potential. But now with what is most likely in most people's eyes a top 10 QB in the league throwing them the ball, I expect everyone's production to improve. Drake London will be the leader of this group and last season he put up 905 yards with two touchdowns and an average of 13 yards per catch. Behind him will be Darnell Mooney who was brought in from Chicago. He put up 414 yards and one touchdown with the Bears. And then Rondell Moore will be the third receiver of this group and he put up just over 350 yards with a touchdown. So there's a lot of improvement that needs to be made with this unit and even Kyle Pitts over at tight end is looking to finally boost his career. Looking at the Falcons 2024 schedule, to me, it's not that bad at all. I easily think this team could be looking at a 9 or 10 win season with the chance to get into the playoffs, but the most important thing for them to do is to continue to make strides in their rebuild. I think we are all going to get a lot of clarity this season on why Atlanta picked Michael Penix Jr. in the draft because it's going to be nice having two QBs that are both starter caliber. They can do so many things, and again, just knowing that you have another guy waiting if Kirk Cousins goes down is a good feeling. That's all I have to say for this video. Thank you all so much if you made it to this point. And if you enjoyed and haven't yet, please make sure to drop a like and subscribe because your support truly does mean the world. And also, follow me on Instagram because I am starting to post cool sports content on there every single day. And until next time, I will see you all later.